you so much for being with us. <laughs> so um, we have a really big crowd uh, joining us today. 118 people had signed up. We usually have about oh, 80% of the people who sign up joining us. Um, Prior to this meeting, we've had 875 people to register to be with us uh, this 2022. And this particular session of the Right Care Initiative uh, Virtual University of Best Practices, which evolved from many live meetings starting in 2008, is our 314th gathering. And we could not have done it without all of your wonderful volunteer work and uh, resources that have been provided from the University of California, the California Department of Public Health, LA Public Health, USC, Stanford, uh, Stroke Awareness Foundation, um, and our biopharmaceutical partners. Um, and thank you, Alyssa Meyer, for stepping in today with a ill staff member of making things slightly more complicated today. So um, would you please go ahead and chat out the CME link and next slide, please. Most of you know me, I've been working on clinical quality improvement sort of since I was about 15 when my mother died of a stroke suddenly. Uh, but formally I uh, studied at UC Davis and at Harvard. Next slide, please. I've devoted my entire career to clinical quality improvement in legislation and in uh, spreading best practices. I want to uh, re-emphasize this data from the Centers for Disease Control that only became available to us during the pandemic. It's so so I want to say that we were talking in our pre-meeting about what are we screening for? Uh, well, what we screen for is breast cancer, cervical cancer, uh, colorectal cancer, and prostate cancer. But what we die of starting in our 30s uh, is cardiovascular disease, whether it's heart attacks, strokes, or hyper hypertension emergencies. So we need to shift our resources and our attention to what is actually killing these young parents. Uh, so I'll just say that it's worse for men than it is for women, uh, but it's not a non-issue for women, even though our primary care doctors would tell you otherwise. So let's um, be sure to be proactively screening for LDL, blood pressure, blood sugar, and I would have to say coronary artery calcium and yes, let's do a sleep survey. Next slide, please. Uh, we have focused on those three metrics uh, that I mentioned a moment ago since we had our very first summit at UCLA in 2008. Next slide, please. Let's keep that LDL cholesterol less than 100. Blood pressure is a little bit more controversial. I'll say 120 over 80, uh, that's optimal. Uh, something less than that. Um, so what we've done over the years is we've presented the medical groups uh, with data about their performance on these critical metrics, and we've inspired them with best practices of seeing who's doing a really good job controlling blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol, and let's learn from them. So Don Hufford, I have to say thank you for joining us today. We haven't seen you for a while. Don was my co-founder of our Sacramento group. And look at these impressive results on blood pressure now in Sacramento. I have to say we haven't updated the numbers in COVID because I think it's a little unfair to the health systems uh, to hold them accountable for something that they couldn't control related to COVID. Next slide, please. We have used a formula of synthesizing the best practices of the top performers, and we teach according to uh, this triangle of what works, which is on our website. I won't spend a lot of time with it, but I think what we're really emphasizing today is patient activation and proactive screening. Next slide, please. 
So uh, today we are going to hear from uh, experts from Stanford, the University of Southern California, and UC Davis. What a wonderful group of volunteers. First, we're going to learn about sleep's relationship to cardiovascular events. Then we're going to hear a critically important patient story from one of our leaders at the University of Southern California, Steve Chen. And then we're going to learn about some ways that we can more proactively screen uh, for atrial fibrillation, which is a key driver of stroke. And then we're going to hear from Dr. William J. Bomber, our chairman, about how do you treat atrial fibrillation to prevent those strokes. Next slide, please. Eleanor Levin of Stanford, thank you so much for being with us. Eleanor built uh, Kaiser's very famous cardiovascular program uh, before she left for Stanford, where she's now a full professor and uh, practicing clinically. Um, and with that, I'll say, Eleanor, let's let you introduce your uh, colleagues from your sleep clinic associated with the cardiovascular clinic. Thank you so much for being with us today. Okay, so I want, thank you. Thank you very much, Hattie. I want to introduce uh, Katie Edwards, PhD. She is an, a clinical assistant professor in the division of cardiology at Stanford and a cognitive behavioral therapist. She began her work at Stanford in the women's heart health arena, helping patients uh, with brief individual and group therapy for anxiety, stress, and depression, and health behavior change related to cardiac conditions, and has now expanded her scope um, to the entire uh, division of cardiology um, as a leader in trying to achieve behavioral health changes. Um, so uh, I'll um, leave it to Katie to tell us about sleep and cardiovascular disease. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Um, so it's a pleasure to be here. And um, when my slides are over, I'll pause and we can introduce my colleague, Dr. Fiona Barwick. But for now, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so y'all can see my slides. Okay, so I'm going to be just talking about sleep and cardiovascular health, which is one of the things that I do help with in the Stanford Cardiology Clinic. First, I want to reveal that I have no conflicts of interest. And then moving on to this very important um, 2022 American Heart Association presidential advisory about life's essential eight. And these are health behaviors and health factors that when they're optimized are associated with greater cardiovascular disease-free survival and total longevity and a higher quality of life. And one of the things that's so exciting about this um, revision of the AHA recommendations is that it now includes healthy sleep. This was not previously part of the uh, equation. It used to be life's simple seven. So now we have life's essential eight and very pleased that it recognizes the importance of sleep. So a lot of the research that we have about sleep and cardiovascular disease focuses on sleep duration. And there are other um, variables of sleep that Dr. Barwick will mention in her talk sleep timing, regularity, efficiency, satisfaction, and daytime alertness. But those um, characteristics of sleep haven't been studied in the same way as sleep duration as far as cardiovascular outcomes. So in this talk I'm gonna give, we're gonna, I'm gonna be talking quite a bit about short sleep duration and, and long sleep, and th these are the definitions. Technically, short sleep is defined as less than seven hours per night and long sleep is defined as more than nine hours per night. 
Um, but the most pronounced effects of short sleep are seen with, pe with people reporting um, equal to or less than four hours of sleep a night. Um, and this, this, interestingly, this relationship is true for people who don't report insufficient sleep. So even if they they feel okay on four or five hours, um, these associations remain the same. And uh, there are stronger relationships between short sleep duration um, in younger than older adults between sl short sleep duration and some of these outcomes and in certain um, diverse groups. So this graph shows an overall relative risk relationship uh, for mortality, um, all cause mortality. So there's not, not just uh, cardiovascular disease, but a kind of an overall slide to demonstrate that we know there's an association between health and sleep. And as we move farther away from uh, around seven hours, uh, we see more, more problems, more risk, a relative risk of, of mortality. So insomnia is a little bit different than short sleep duration, but they can definitely overlap. Um, insomnia is a, a diagnosis that's based solely on a subjective report of poor sleep. And it, it includes complaints of having difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep through the night, even when someone has enough time to sleep, so an adequate opportunity. Um, and also includes daytime dysfunction, like problems with drowsiness, poor concentration, um, and other mood interferences as well. So the, um, the, those that have short sleep duration um, typically show a biological vulnerability, which is part of what I'm gonna talk about today um, with less than sleep, with less than six hours of sleep. Um, so it's, it's sort of like you can squeak by with six, but maybe still try to get seven or eight. Um, that, that's where we really start to see the biological vulnerabilities kick in. So for the purposes of this talk, I'm gonna be sometimes talking out about short sleep duration, which is more of where the research is, and sometimes talking about insomnia, because that's more of what the cl clinical presentation is when we see patients in the clinic. Um, so this slide also shows um, a, a picture of some of the complications of insomnia. And uh, this is actually a little bit of an older picture, but back in 2010, there were a number of uh, researchers that were already trying to explain the importance of sleep for cardiovascular outcomes and trying to get sleep on the list of um, important uh, risk factors to monitor. So this is from that. So the next slide is is just showing kind of where the research is right now as far as sleep and um, some of the cardiovascular disease uh, outcomes. Uh, so this shows the associations between short sleep, long sleep, um, insomnia, and SDB, which is sleep disordered breathing. So that's your apnea and other breathing issues. So the associations that we know of between these sleep issues and certain uh, medical problems related to cardiovascular disease. So we have um, associations with diabetes, hypertension, um, heart disease, so heart attack, stroke, and total cardiovascular disease. So one of the things that's sort of a little bit striking about this table is just that insomnia research isn't quite there. So uh, it's not that there isn't research being done, but it's sort of like, there's not quite enough yet. And we don't have meta-analytical data, which gives us the assurance that there's a strong association. So I think this research is, is coming. Um, and I think we're gonna find similar associations because of the overlap between insomnia and short sleep duration. All right, so I'm gonna spend a bit of time on this slide because this is really um, a summary of the research on short sleep duration and some of the mechanisms, the biological mechanisms that occur 
when we don't get enough sleep. This, some of these mechanisms are also indicated in long sleep, uh, but more research has been done on short sleep and some of the long sleep research seems a little bit less clear. And Fiona being a sleep expert, if, if she might comment on that during her talk, we'll see. But for now, I'm gonna focus on what we know about short sleep. Um, so short sleep impacts uh, blood glucose. We know that um, people have uh, poor fasting glucose and hyperglycemia, which can lead directly to oxidative stress and inflammation and vascular cell damage. So if the vessels are damaged, the vessels are more likely to, um, to accumulate plaque. And so we also know that short sleep duration, uh, the insulin resistance can affect lipid metabolism. So then we have problems with low, L, uh, low uh, HDLs and high LDLs and triglycerides. And, and again, more likely of likelihood of plaque buildup. Uh, increased sympathetic activity and vascular tone. Um, this is really kind of the fight or flight response the stress response, if we don't sleep enough, we get kicked into this. And this can cause different changes that relate to cardiovascular disease. So for example, um, when we have an increased sympathetic tone, we often have higher blood pressure. Um, we find that with uh, people who have insomnia, they have um, less of a blood pressure decrease during sleep and um, they also have higher incidence of hypertension. And that hypertension also causes vessel damage and arterial stiffening and narrowing, which leads to plaque formation. And then there's this issue of systemic inflammation. So we have research showing that short sleep duration, um, there's evidence of increased uh, inflammatory markers in the bloodstream and decreased um, anti-inflammatory markers. And inflammatory cells are not great for cardiovascular disease. Um, they are part of plaque formation. So inflammatory cells are part of what starts to build a plaque. Inflammation in the vessels actually promotes coagulation and plaque formation. And even um, inflama inflammatory cells can in affect when plaques rupture. So they can actually promote plaque rupture causing your heart attack and stroke. So we've got um, a number of different outcomes of short sleep that we know are predictive of some of these risk factors of cardiovascular disease. And then really more in, in my area, oops, I went one slide ahead too far. Let's see if I can go back. Oh, okay, I don't know why that wasn't working for a little bit. So in more in my area, we have the behavioral mediators. So we know that these are there are these biological mechanisms that occur when we have short sleep or poor sleep. But then behaviorally and, and um, cognitively, we also have some problems. So poor sleep affects mood, it affects energy, it affects our judgment and decision-making. We are a little bit more emotionally reactive and in general have trouble with poor self-regulation. And a place where this comes into play quite a lot is with eating. So with the stress response being activated, we often start to crave different types of foods like um, more foods that are higher in fat, higher in sugar. Some of our um, hormones are altered by short sleep and it changes our appetite. It changes how, um, how full we feel. And so these kind of biological urges change and then the sleepiness and the tiredness and the, the um, kind of poor cognitive functioning, more emotional reacting can really make it easy to, to make poor food choices. Um, and also feeling tired, sluggish makes it harder to get out and get that physical exercise that we need for heart health. And generally, um, overall feeling a sense of increased stress, perhaps again, increased um, sympathetic activation, and just not having all of our um, 
emotional and cognitive resources available to help us combat the stress response. So it kind of can create a little bit of a downward spiral. The poor sleep leads to more stress. The poor sleep leads us to be not able to handle the stress. Then we get more poor sleep. And as you can see, it just perpetuates the stress response. So these, these things are not helpful for managing risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So here is what we have as far as outcomes for what we know now with some, um, some pretty decent data about sleep is that um, it increases the relative risk of developing or dying from heart disease or stroke. And likewise, long sleep duration also increases the relative risk. And when I looked at these numbers, I was kind of flabbergasted. They're really high. Um, that, that one with stroke being 65% with long sleep duration, that one had me going to search the internet as to like, okay, why? You know, let me look for some articles. Why is this? And it seems like that question hasn't been completely answered, but there is some recognition that people with long sleep duration may have other comorbidities. Um, so these are associations, not necessarily causes. So um, people who are sleeping longer might have higher incidence of depression. Um, they might have a more sedentary lifestyle where they just sleep more. Um, they might have sleep disordered breathing and that contributes to um, long sleep. So there could be other problems that are driving these associations, but it's pretty stunning when you look at how sleep is associated with cardiovascular disease. Okay. So now we're coming to the part where I'm just gonna talk a little bit about what I do. So uh, as Eleanor Levin mentioned, Dr. Levin, um, I'm a clinical psychologist and I was hired at Stanford back in, well, first in 2011 and kind of a part-time research capacity and then in 2013 as a clinical faculty. And um, my role is to be embedded in the cardiac clinic and to be a resource for cardiologists and nurse practitioners and advanced practice providers to refer their patients for brief treatment. And one of the brief treatments that I provide is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. And I'm really looking forward to Dr. Barwick's part of the presentation. She's really our sleep expert and will tell us more about that treatment and sleep in general. But for now, I can share what we do in the cardiac clinic. Um, we know that a large proportion of patients in cardiac clinic do have insomnia, but it's not often and something that a cardiologist thinks to ask. So I'm hoping with um, Life's Essential Eight that our cardiologists will think more about asking about sleep. And this is the question to ask. It's really simple. On average, how many hours of sleep do you think you're getting per night? Because much of our research is on sleep duration, we're just asking a simple question about sleep duration can open up a whole discussion about sleep. And then typically if a patient is referred to me for sleep problems, I'll give them the insomnia severity index, which is a pretty short measure. It has seven items about how, how difficult it is to fall asleep, how satisfied the person is with their sleep, if they're worried about sleep, if it interferes in their functioning, and if they think that other people can notice how poor their sleep is and how it affects their quality of life. So um, I think that's probably gonna be one of our goals in the next 10 years is to try to increase the amount, the focus on screening for sleep problems and then referring for treatment. So this next slide is actually a small pilot research study that I did back when I first started at Stanford. This was as Dr. Levin mentioned in Women's Heart Health. And these are self-report uh, measures. So I, I definitely cannot say that we have this much prevalence of these disorders in our clinic because I did not screen them and interview them and do a, a formal diagnosis. But these are the symptoms that patients were complaining of. And we were really surprised. I was surprised that the top problem was insomnia. And we had a large proportion of women that were reporting, I mean, over 20% were reporting um, moderate to severe insomnia. So one of the things that we did at that time is we developed a small research study to treat the insomnia and kind of track how things, how things went after the treatment. So 24 women ultimately were treated with cognitive behavioral therapy 
And this includes components of stimulus control, um, which is kind of working on reducing sleep interfering um, stimuli, <laughs> and then reducing arousal and activation. So um, kind of soothing the nervous system a bit, and then using a technique called sleep restriction to try to kind of reset the sleep uh, rhythm in someone's body. So I provided four to eight individual sessions and up to 12 as needed. Patients were asked to complete a weekly sleep diary and I created an individualized plan for each patient. We had a pretty high target for um, 90 to 95% sleep efficiency. The average is uh, kind of healthy, normal average is 85. And then um, sleep efficiency was actually the target of our treatment. So this is the idea that when you're in bed, you're sleeping and you're not um, spending lots of time in bed uh, awake and tossing and turning. And this is one of the core components of cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. So sleep efficiency is the average time you actually slept divided by the average time you spent in bed. So we want that to be a high, a high percentage. So I, I'm not gonna go into super detail on this slide because Dr. Barwick will really speak to this, but I did just wanna share what are those components that we teach in treatment. So the stimulus con control, some of the examples are um, to have a dark and quiet environment, to um, associate the bed with sleep and really not much else. Um, sleep and sex pretty much is, is it. Not to associate the bed with reading and scrolling on your phone and lying awake, thinking about your problems and all the other things that we do in bed. Um, and trying to limit things that will stimulate our, our system late at night or close to bedtime, like um, exercise and caffeine and emotional discussions. And um, also to avoid clock watching and, and trying to notice the time and then do the calculations. How much sleep am I getting? How much sleep am I losing? And then the reducing arousal and activation, some of the things we'll do is just to, to teach relaxation exercises just to help people get into their physical body and kind of move away from some of the worries, targeting sleep-related worries and thoughts and challenging beliefs that are really not true about sleep. Um, and then managing worries in, with different tools like setting aside worry time, having a notepad by the bed to jot down concerns and soothing or boring activities. We've probably all heard these at different times. Then the sleep, re sleep restriction formula is over there on the right. Um, and I don't really need to go too much into it, but essentially what we do is in the first few weeks of sleep treatment, we actually track how much they're sleeping. And if it's only four or five hours, then that becomes the amount of time they're allowed to stay in bed. And that's what we mean by sleep restriction. We restrict it to how much time they're actually getting when they come in for treatment and hopefully build up some really strong sleep debt if, if those people follow the rules and stay up the rest of the day and don't nap very much, maybe a very short nap, then they, they build up a lot of sleep drive and then they can actually sleep much better during those four or five hours. It starts to even out the sleep quality. And then we gradually add more time while sticking to these sleep hygiene rules on this slide. So I'm just wrapping up here. I'm gonna show you some data from this study. Um, these are from three different patients, just illustrating the effects of using the different components. So always I would start with um, stimulus control. And this was a person who started out with um, about five hours sleep a night. And th this blue diamond shows how long it took them to fall asleep. That's what sleep latency is, like how long they would lie in bed or be like waiting to fall asleep. The red square is um, how much they woke up at night in the middle of the night. And the green triangle is um, how much did they wake too early in the morning? So these are basically th three common ways that insomnia can present. Either people can't fall asleep, they wake up in the middle of the night or they wake up too early in the morning, or maybe it's a combination of some of these or all three. Everyone's a little bit different, but these are the things to track their lost sleep. So when these are high, they're not sleeping great. When these get low, they're doing better. This patient, after five weeks of really just focusing on the stimulus control, increased uh, her average sleep to 6.5 hours and her sleep efficiency from 77% to 91%. So she was sleeping 91% of the time she was in bed.
The next one is um, kind of adding that next component. So stimulus control plus um, some skills to reduce arousal and distress around sleep. And this was a little bit of a longer uh, treatment. And um, this person, one, one of the things that happened is sometimes there's a little bit of a bump. We can start to decrease certain aspects of the insomnia, but then other ones increase and that's pretty, pretty normal. But eventually she got to a point where she was um, sleeping seven, seven and three quarters hours after starting at five and her sleep efficiency was up to 93%. And then finally, this is someone who we employed sleep restriction. She was kind of ready for it and willing to do it. It's not easy. She started it around week four and it just really knocked her symptoms out. So the, um, the stimulus control and the uh, arousal reduction worked okay, but she wanted more. And when she started doing it, things really got better. And by the end, she was sleeping six and a half hours and had 95% sleep efficiency. So this is just proof, I guess, um, that it can work to treat insomnia in the context of a cardiac clinic. And from the follow-up uh, data from this study, we found that patients reported less perceived stress and they did overall uh, uh, among the 24 of them uh, uh, achieve approved sleep efficiency. And then um, we also found that, and this is statistically a little more complicated, but um, basically trying to associate changes in sleep efficiency and changes in these other measures and found that when the sleep efficiency changed, so people who did well with treatment, basically who had a higher change in sleep efficiency showed some more significant decreases in blood pressure. Um, but then we found this really unusual, unexpected finding, well, weight actually went in the wrong direction. So people who increased sleep efficiency got heavier. So that didn't make sense to us, but sometimes in pilot studies, things don't make sense. It's a small N. Um, so this was just, you know, kind of re reassuring in the sense of that we know sleep is a problem in cardiac patients. And we know that if we treat sleep, we might be able to improve their outcomes. And I think Dr. Barwick will talk more about that. Could I just ask you to go back two slides to that blood pressure slide, please? Because a lot of our Sure. Uh, physicians are, are very interested in that topic. So one back. Okay, so talk about the uh, what you see on this slide, please. Uh, okay, so this is actually not the blood pressure outcome, but this does show the numbers. So maybe before we go to the next slide, we can just look at the numbers. So um, so this looks for at intake at the beginning of the study, the average systolic blood pressure was 122. Um, at follow-up, it was 128. This is average. Diastolic, 78, and at follow-up, 80. So actually, in raw numbers, their blood pressure increased if you average all 24. But then the next slide is when we looked at those patients who showed they like were treatment responders. They did well with the sleep treatment, and their sleep efficiency really did increase. Those patients showed that they had a decrease in their blood pressure, both systolic and diastolic. And I don't actually have those raw numbers, like an average of what that decrease was, but we did show an association. So my last slide is just, um, it kind of makes me want to jump for joy, actually. This is an excerpt from that same AHA 2022 statement about cardiac risk factors. And a huge acknowledgement of the foundational nature of psychological health in man maintaining cardiovascular health because all of those um, life's essential eight to be able to uh, stay within the preferred ranges for all of those different markers, it takes a lot of, um, of work. And it's hard to do if there are barriers like um, poor psychological health or um, social determinants of health, where there's a situation that's just not conducive to taking care of one's health in this way. And there's a lot of research out there as well about just uh, general cardiovascular in, uh, outcomes being better with people who report that they have psychological well being and they're great, grateful and they're optimistic versus those that report depression, anxiety, anger, and stress. So just great to, to see that it's being acknowledged and hopefully in the future, 
we'll get more and more embedded psychologists into cardiology clinics um, and just to be able to treat this and acknowledge the importance of it going forward. So thank you so much. I'm going to hand it back to Eleanor to introduce Fiona. So uh, Fiona's a clinical associate professor uh, in the School of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry. She's also a clinical psychologist and she's in the sleep medicine division and she's a associate division chief for behavioral sleep medicine and director of the behavioral circadian rhythms sleep disorder specialty clinic as well as the insomnia clinic. So we're very excited to hear about treatment for sleep disorders. Take it away, Fiona. Thank you. Please unmute Dr. Barwick. Oh yeah, good point. <laughs> I was just saying thanks, Dr. Levin, and thank you to the Right Care Initiative for the opportunity to speak about sleep and cardiovascular health. Um, and thanks, of course, Dr. Edwards. I always like your talks. It's such a nice overview of insomnia and its relation to cardiovascular health. I am going to shift the focus a little bit. I'm definitely going to talk initially, I, mainly because I want to talk about what I think you and your patients need to know, would be helpful to know about sleep. As uh, Dr. Sears Edwards, I have no relevant conflict of interest to disclose. Uh, I am going to touch briefly on sleep problems and cardiovascular consequences because sleep is complicated. That is the main message I want you to get from that. It is more complicated than just insomnia. Um, I then want to touch on some common sleep misconceptions because this is actually very helpful for patients to know. I think how we present information to our patients and to ourselves uh, can actually either exacerbate or even create sleep problems that didn't exist before. I've seen this happen. Um, and I do want to provide a framework for understanding sleep health and how sleep works. This framework underlies any recommendation you, will, you would want to make to your patient to help improve their sleep. So first, sleep problems uh, and cardiovascular consequences. So I said it's more complicated than insomnia. It is certainly the case that if people are losing sleep, then that is going to have negative cardiovascular consequences. However, there are multiple ways in which someone can lose sleep. Insufficient sleep is probably one of the biggest. This is data from the CDC's Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System that they conduct every few years, as well as the National Sleep Foundation Sleep in America poll that they also conduct every few years. You can see in the upper left that the percentage of people reporting that they get less than seven hours of sleep Dr. Edwards mentioned earlier that, that for some studies, not all by any means, but some studies, that is the definition of short sleep. Um, so the percentage of people in the US, adults in the US, getting less than seven hours of sleep has stayed roughly the same since between 2013 and 2020. It's about well, over 35%. Uh, this does vary by state. So those states you can see in the right here that are deeper orange. These are the ones that are showing higher rates of U.S. adults reporting less than seven hours of sleep. It also varies by race and ethnicity. So in this chart on the lower left, you can see that for Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, uh, Black Americans, American Indians, there are higher percentages who are getting less sleep. And you can also see that there are a lot of us who are feeling sleepy during the day. So almost half are feeling sleepy anywhere from two to four days a week, over a quarter, feeling sleepy five to seven days a week. This highlights something that I will be highlighting with every sleep disorder we go over. It is a 24-hour disorder. It is not just what happens at night. It's also what happens during the day. And you have to look at both of these to try to get a sense of what is going on. Why is sleep and daytime functioning being adversely affected? But insufficient sleep is probably the biggest driver of sleep loss in our country. It looks pretty similar for other countries with some exceptions. Um, another driver would be insomnia. Now, it's interesting, insomnia is not the same thing as sleep loss. This is commonly misunderstood. Um, insomnia, the formal definition, as Dr. Edwards was saying, difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, waking up early, unable to get back to sleep, has to be going on often enough, at least three times a week, for long enough, at least three months 
to qualify as insomnia, and it has to be occurring despite adequate opportunity and circumstances to sleep, and there does have to be some clinically significant distress or impairment during the day. I prefer to think about insomnia as anxiety about sleep. Uh, it is different than sleep loss. With insufficient sleep, if you were allow, you're not allowing yourself enough time in bed to sleep. If you allowed yourself more time to sleep, you'd get more sleep. Insomnia, that's not, what ha that's not what's happening. People are allowing themselves plenty of time to sleep, but they're lying there awake. Why is that? Lots of different reasons. It is anxiety about sleep. And people with insomnia, more than any other group, underestimate how much sleep they get. People without insomnia overestimate how much sleep they get. It's one of the problems with the research. If you simply ask someone how much sleep they get, what they tell you is inaccurate, always. Because the discrepancy between objective sleep measures and subjective sleep measures is quite clear. Objective sleep is measured by polysomnogram, which is an overnight sleep study. The only way we truly know if you're awake or asleep is if we have electrodes attached to your scalp. We see what your brain is doing across the night. Or you could use an actigraph, so a wearable that has been um, validated in multiple clinical populations for amount of sleep. But subjective sleep is invariably wrong. What I would say is the short sleep duration that Dr. Edwards was referencing, it's really ob insomnia with objective short sleep duration. So it is objectively measured short sleep duration. For probably the majority of people with insomnia, they underestimate how much sleep they get. For those with objective short sleep duration, their assessment of their sleep is actually pretty accurate, and it's usually five hours or less. So what's going on with insomnia then? If people aren't losing sleep, this is where the anxiety about sleep comes in. It's a stress response. And there does seem to be pretty consistent research showing that insomnia is a disorder of hyperarousal, a 24-hour disorder of hyperarousal. So people with insomnia show higher whole body and brain metabolic rates. They show greater sympathetic activity, not just during the day, but also at night, including elevated cortisol levels, which Dr. Edwards referenced. Uh, they show greater cognitive arousal, greater emotional arousal. They show higher frequency EEG activity on sleep studies at night. So this is not just happening at night, probably one of the reasons that's making it hard for them to fall asleep when they happen to be awake, but it is also happening during the day. Chronic insomnia affects, well, 30 to 35% of the US, of US adults will report insomnia symptoms at some point. Six to 10% will meet criteria for insomnia disorder. It is more common in women. It is more common as we get older. The prevalence rates are pretty similar across countries with possibly lower rates in Asia, but that's really not clear. So insufficient sleep, a big cause of sleep loss. Chronic insomnia, a big cause of poor sleep, not necessarily sleep loss, although for some people it will be sleep loss, but not all, but certainly a disorder of hyperarousal, including anxiety. Then we have circadian misalignment. So circadian rhythms, I'm sure you all know, biological rhythms fluctuate across the 24-hour light-dark cycle, regulate lots of our behavior and physiology. The most obvious circadian rhythm is our sleep-wake pattern, but really there are circadian genes in every cell in our body. Um, circadian misalignment is when there is a mismatch between the timing of your endogenous sleep-wake rhythm and the desired or required time or schedule for sleep and wakefulness. Now, usually that desired or required schedule is driven by work demands or school demands or family demands, although sometimes it's internally driven. Um, the main contributors, the main causes, jet travel, shift work, delayed sleep phase. So jet travel, of course, that's been on a bit of a hiatus over the past three years, but we now live in a globally interconnected world. We can fly halfway around the world, get there in a day. And that is not what we were biologically designed to do. That will disrupt your sleep-wake patterns. It will actually disrupt all your circadian patterns. Um, shift work, probably 20%, I suspect more at this point, of people are now doing some form of shift work. So what happens with shift work, you are sleeping at a time when you're normally awake and trying to be awake, awake at a time when you're normally supposed to be sleeping. This is a known health risk. Shift work is a known health risk um, for a variety of cardiovascular problems. And I'll get to the diagram in a moment. But if what shift, the fact that shift work is a known health risk tells us that if you are in a state of circadian misalignment, whatever the cause, you're putting your health at risk. Now, delayed sleep phase, there is normal variability in the timing of sleep. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, our society is designed for not night owls, but more morning types. So we assume everyone should be awake and alert at 7 a.m., 6 a.m. That is not accurate. That is not helpful. Night owls, oftentimes, natural wake time might be 9 or 10 a.m. So if they're having to get up at 7 a.m. because they need to go into work, they're doing shift work. 
and we know shift work is a health risk. So circadian misalignment, people will often be awake when they're trying to sleep. They'll be sleeping when they're trying to be awake. They experience all the things that sleep loss can do, the irritability, the uh, difficulty focusing, the emotional dysregulation. Uh, so circadian misalignment, and, and certainly with shift work and with delayed sleep phase, we know people are not getting the full amount of sleep they would if they were not doing shift work or were able to sleep in phase. So circadian misalignment is another cause of sleep loss, but even apart from the sleep loss, when your circadian rhythms are misaligned, that has adverse health consequences by itself. So we've got, and, and circadian misalignment, let's assume 20%, maybe 25% of people are, I think more at this point, <laughs> which we'll get into later, but let's assume 20, 25% in a state of circadian misalignment. So we've got insufficient sleep, almost 40%. We've got insomnia, 30, 35%. We've got shift work and other forms of circadian misalignment, 20%. And now we've got sleep apnea, another 24 hour disorder. Sleep apnea, of course, uh, complete or partial, complete cessation or partial restriction of airflow uh, for a variety of reasons, whether it's craniofacial factors or excess tissue in the soft palate. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with nighttime symptoms. People snore or they wake up gasping or their bed partner sees them not breathing or they're waking up a lot and they don't know why, sometimes getting up to use the bathroom a lot three or more times a night. They might get, have night sweats, they might have teeth grinding, they might have GERD, they certainly will have unrefreshing sleep. Um, it is not, however, I've mentioned all of these things, in, insufficient sleep, insomnia, circadian misalignment, all are 24 hour disorders. So there aren't just nighttime symptoms, there are daytime symptoms. People wake up with a headache in the morning, dry eyes, dry mouth, they, feel sleepy during the day, they feel slowed, they feel foggy, they feel irritated, there's a drop in mood, a drop in libido, so lots of daytime symptoms. About 34% of men, it is more common in men, 34% of men um, have sleep apnea, 17% of women. My guess is those two estimates are almost certainly underestimates, especially for women, because women present differently. They are not often overweight, they do not always snore, it is more they are waking up frequently, um, what I call sleep surfing and sometimes more vivid dreams because sleep apnea is more common in REM sleep. Um, but interestingly, up to 70% of people with undiagnosed sleep apnea will have insomnia. And the bed partners of those whose sleep apnea is not treated, 30% of them will have insomnia. So this is why I say sleep is complicated. What we're looking at here is all of these things, all of these sleep problems, insufficient sleep, insomnia, circadian misalignment, sleep apnea, all of these have cardiovascular consequences. Obesity is probably among the most common, inflammation as well, hypertension as well, um, hormone changes with sleep loss for sure, dyslipidemia with sleep apnea, with sleep loss, circadian misalignment, diabetes, same thing, sleep apnea, circadian misalignment, heart attack, stroke, heart disease, all of those sleep disorders that I just talked about have these types of cardiovascular consequences. So the question becomes, how, what, do we, what do we do about this? Because it's tricky. What we're looking at here is, are, are multiple factors that can contribute to cardiovascular outcomes. So one is sleep loss. I've already mentioned insufficient sleep involves sleep loss. Insomnia may or may not involve sleep loss. Circadian misalignment definitely involves sleep loss. Sleep apnea definitely involves sleep loss as well. So sleep loss by itself is a contributor. Circadian misalignment, a second contributor. When your circadian rhythms are misaligned, lots of negative things happen. We tend to feel best, function best, sleep best when we are in alignment. All our circadian rhythms are in alignment with our body clock. So we've got sleep loss, we've got circadian misalignment, stress. So insomnia, anxiety about sleep, anxiety, reflection of stress. There is some indication that people with insomnia are more reactive to stress. Stress is not good for various aspects of health, not just sleep. Sleep is like the canary in the coal mine. If your sleep is disrupted, then almost certainly your stress level is too high, unless there's some other underlying condition that's, that's contributing. But stress is another disruptor of sleep. Poor sleep hygiene. What do people do when they're not sleeping well or highly stressed? Well, you're going to eat food, as Dr. Edward was pointing out, that you really shouldn't be eating. That's going to increase the obesity and the risk for diabetes. You're going to maybe use a little alcohol to help you fall asleep. You're not going to exercise as much. So all of these things, all of these sleep hygiene aspects are going to contribute to the cardiovascular consequences. So we've got sleep loss, we've got circadian misalignment, we've got stress, we've got lifestyle problems, and of course, with sleep apnea of hypoxemia. 
So one of the major risk factors for uh, adverse cardiovascular outcomes with sleep apnea is when your airflow is blocked or restricted, you're not getting the same amount of oxygen you would if you were breathing freely, so your oxygen levels can drop the amount they drop, the time they spend below 90% saturation, that has definitely been associated with risk of uh, not just high blood pressure, diabetes, but heart attack and stroke. So what do we do with all of this? The, I do think it's very important to share with our patients an accurate understanding of sleep because what ends up happening, I see this a lot with my patients, what ends up happening is People come in so anxious about sleep because of everything that they've been told by their doctors and everything they're reading in the media that they actually have insomnia. Now, that's usually not the only cause of the insomnia. There's often a lot of stuff in addition. But the anxiety about sleep is going to make sleep worse. And so I often share with my patients things that will reduce that anxiety. And these things go directly counter to a lot of what you read or hear in the media. For example, this chart. There's a chart put up by the National Sleep Foundation. It purports to show recommended sleep times. It does not. This, these recommendations were based on a review of the literature by experts in the field. Unfortunately, no fault of the experts, they did their job. But the studies, how did they, how did they determine how much sleep, sleep people were getting? They asked. And I just told you how inaccurate that is. So none of this is accurate. Now, I'm sure it's not completely out of the ballpark, but the other part of this is, so I like to highlight this because it does show normal variability in sleep. There's normal genetic variability in how much sleep we need. 40% of variability in sleep need is genetic. So if I, someone comes in and tells me they need eight hours of sleep and they actually turn out to be a six and a half hour sleep person, I'm not going to tell them they need eight hours of sleep. We're going to work together to figure out how much sleep they truly need by making various changes until we hit that, that optimal window. But I don't want, the first thing I do is correct people's misconception that they absolutely need eight hours of sleep. No, they don't. I tell anyone who comes into my clinic, we don't know yet what your sleep need is. We will figure it out together. But I want them loosened from the thing that's causing them anxiety. Because if they're thinking they need eight hours of sleep, they're going to be in bed for nine hours to get that eight hours. If they only need six and a half, they're now awake for two and a half hours every night, guaranteed. So it's very important to understand how to interpret this, this chart. So it shows recommended, quote unquote, sleep duration from newborns on the left to older adults, 65 and older on the right. This, let's take this bar, the 26 to 64 year olds, the one, the second one from the right. So the dark blue in the center, these are the average sleepers, like the people of average height. There's normal variability in height and weight, sleep is the same. These are the average sleepers. People, I, the way I describe it, people need to spend seven to nine hours in bed to get the right amount of sleep with the assumption that they are spending at least 85% of that time asleep. So that's efficient sleep. That is good sleep. That's exactly what Dr. Edwards talked about. That doesn't mean they're sleeping the whole time. Like if someone is in bed for seven hours, getting six hours of sleep, that's 86% sleep efficiency. That's normal sleep. You can be awake for an hour and still be considered to get good sleep for an adult. This often shocks people. Underneath are the short sleepers, the ones who need to spend six hours in bed to get the right amount of sleep, and above are the long sleepers, the ones who need to spend 10 hours in bed to get the right amount of sleep, all normal sleep. Number two, variability in sleep timing. There's genetic variability in sleep timing. What time you should be going to sleep? 50% of our sleep timing is genetic. There are larks and hummingbirds and owls. Hummingbirds are the ones for whom our culture, our society is designed. They're the ones who naturally feel sleepy at 10 or 11 and then naturally awake at six or seven. Morning larks feel sleepy a lot earlier, usually six to eight in the evening, but then they're awake a lot earlier, two to four in the morning. Um, night owls are the ones who feel sleepy later, usually sometime after midnight. One to two a.m. is the most common bedtime I see, nine to 10, 10 a.m. the most common rise time. Again, all normal sleep. The ones who suffer the most, the ones who are doing the shift work are the night owls because oftentimes they are not allowed to sleep and wake in the windows that work best for them. I'm a big proponent of Having all of us sleep and wake in the window that works best for us, there are tests for determining what your circadian sleep window is. Um, and I will write letters supporting accommodations when appropriate because health shift work, which my adults are doing, is a known health risk. So normal genetic variability in sleep need, normal genetic variability in sleep timing. I cannot tell you when I share this information with patients how much of a relief it is for some of them because they're going to bed, lying awake for two and a, two and a half hours, thinking they need eight hours of sleep when they actually don't, and one of the other little tidbits of information I share with people, when they've looked at sleep in hunter-gatherer tribes, 
in South America and Africa, the ones who are presumably sleeping the sleep we would have slept 50,000 years ago before light pollution, noise pollution, technology. On average, what circadian sleep, what sleep trackers show is that adults are getting six and a half hours of sleep. So this whole idea that everyone needs eight hours, no, you, you got to toss that out if, if you want to help your patients improve their sleep, unless they're not allowing themselves enough time in bed to get the sleep they could. <laughs> um, there's another thing. People often wake up thinking they should feel refreshed in the morning. Well, guess what? That's not necessarily true. There is, we'll talk about sleep drive and circadian processes in a moment. Well, sleep drive is a biological drive. That's the one in red that builds as we're awake and active and comes down as we sleep. Um, the circadian system, the circadian wake drive, that's the blue line. These, it's interesting because if our sleep drive is building as we're awake and active, literally we're all getting sleepier. Like right now we are all much sleepier than we were when we woke up this morning because our sleep drive is higher. We've been awake for a bit. We're not falling asleep, why not? Because the circadian system sends out alerting cues to keep us awake. Um, usually those alerting cues are light, physical activity, social activity. You might be falling asleep now because you're not able to move as much. You can't talk. You'd be more awake if you could. Uh, but the alerting cues counter the sleep pressure, keeping us awake until they drop off. And this is where sleep will unfold. But there's a third process, sleep inertia. So this green line, this is happening right as we wake up. This green line is basically showing you the, the departure of melatonin from your system. Melatonin makes us feel groggy. It drops our mood. When we wake up in the morning, melatonin is not fully out of our system. It takes time for it to get out. The best way to get it out, stand up, start moving around and get some light. Temperature and light, those are your two friends to help morning alertness. But if you wake up and don't and feel a little groggy, that's normal. Doesn't mean you don't sleep well. You want to wait and see how you're functioning the rest of the day. Usually it takes maybe 30 minutes for that sleep inertia to pass. For evening types who are getting up early, it can take hours. So this is the other thing. Not, if you don't wake up feeling refreshed in the morning, that doesn't necessarily mean you didn't sleep well. There's also a difference between being tired and being sleepy. Uh, I think we've only got, let's see. Oh yeah, we are out of time. Wow. <laughs> That's too bad. <laughs> I have to say this is absolutely fascinating, Dr. Barwick. I think we're all just loving it. We do have uh, one of our other Stanford presenters, Dr. Marco Perez, who says he needs to go back into surgery soon. Uh, so, Nerali, you had a suggestion. Do you want to unmute yourself? And um... <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Shannon. This has been really amazing. And I think people are going to have a lot of questions. And maybe we could continue a little bit more after. Um, Dr. Perez is able to speak since he's only able to be with us for a few minutes. Would that be okay? Yeah, you know what? I think, I don't think I have a patient at once. I think I might be okay, but I, I would have to be off by two. Yes, that Does sounds that perfect. Yes. Okay. Um, so good. let's give, let's introduce uh, Marco, who's on. Perfect. Okay. So it's my pleasure. I'm Norelli. I'm one of the stroke neurologists here at Stanford and I'm do a lot of work sort of connecting brain and heart, which um, we heard about sleep and heart and sleep and brain a little bit today already from our speakers. And I'm going to kind of transition over to Marco Perez, who has worked on atrial fibrillation, which we're going to, which we will probably hear from our patient speaker, could be linked to sleep. Um, but in any case, Dr. Perez is an associate professor of medicine at Stanford. He's a cardiac electrophysiologist and also has done amazing research in an area that we've talked about a lot in this group, like um, the Apple Heart Study, and also has worked on the Women's Heart Initiative, uh, Women's Health Initiative, looking at atrial fibrillation in that cohort. To save time, I won't go through his amazing bio, which is here, but um, we're, it's a real pleasure for him to talk to us a little bit about how devices can be incorporated into identifying atrial fibrillation and you know, maybe we'll, we'll get back to devices and sleep as well and, and how these all could be linked to think about improving our health together. So um, Dr. Perez, if you could join us now, um, we'll try to get you in for your next patient. Great. Thank you, Dr. Perez. All right, well, uh, can you all hear me? Yes, it sounds great. And your slides aren't in presentation mode yet. There we go. There okay. we go. All right, can you see my presentation then? Yes. Okay, very good. 
All right. So, uh, so just amazing talks from um, from Dr. Barwick and 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 Dr. Edwards and and you know, I, I uh, you know, it's, 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 this is this is all connected. You know, um, so so with with uh, you know, I was listening to Katie's talk and and just you know, we we've been looking at the Women's Health Initiative and this whole link. You know, that there's a greater appreciation of sleep and atrial fibrillation, and we actually looked in our Women's Health Initiative data and and saw that there was uh, you know, a pretty strong link between. Uh, things like depression and anxiety and atrial fibrillation, and that's well known. But the interesting thing that we're finding is that insomnia and, and, and measures of sleep disorders are the mediators uh, between some of these uh, psychological disorders and AFib, and, and at least in this elderly population. So, you know, more to come. And I think we're, we're you know, with the AHA just announcing the, uh, you know, the, the, the changes in some of these recommendations, I think we're all getting more and more interested in sleep. And I think it's and, and, and of course that dovetails into the whole uh, question of how, how are we gonna assess sleep? You know, and, um, and I mean, not everybody can come in for a sleep lab study, which uh, is, is you know, ideal, but, but not gonna happen. Um, the question will be, you know, how can we use wearable devices to help, um, help us uh, manage some of, uh, some of the sleep disorders in our patients? Unfortunately, that's not what I'm talking about today um, but uh, but but I, I think it is it is salient and um, and it is an area of interest that that we uh, that we have and and maybe uh, dr. Barwick and, and dr. Uh, Edwards I, I might I might uh, hit you up on some uh, <laughs> recommendations and maybe even work together um, with the women's health initiative uh, going forward but in any case let me talk about um, uh, atrial fibrillation a little bit more and some of the wearable um, technologies that we have um, and we've been using. So these are these are uh, some of my disclosures. Um, so you know, the I think one thing to to, to note is that the technologies in this space, uh, as as in a lot of the the uh, device tech, uh, uh, technology space, it, are, are 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 changing very rapidly. Um, and as physicians and clinicians and researchers, we're we're often trying to keep up with uh, all of the changes. Um, and the changes come in the form of different uh, different devices, different sensors. Um, and, and there are different ways that you can uh, trigger a recording or have a recording just uh, recording the background, you know, how long you're going to record for and, and so on. So um, classically, when we look for atrial fibrillation, it, it, uh, you know, we use things like wearable uh, electrodes. So, so many of you are familiar with things like the Holter monitor. Over the last few years, the technology really shifted towards these, these smaller uh, wearable devices called ECG patches. So many of you might might, might work with a Zeo pat, patch uh, and, and so on. Um, but and that's really changed the field. But um, but what we're what we're really starting to use a lot more of now are, are these portable ECG devices, um, often wearable uh, devices. And so so things like the CardioMobile, which you know some of you might 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 have used or or, or your patients have used. Um, which, you know, this came out about 10 years ago, and that was a big uh, advance in our field, you know, the ability to just have a uh, patient uh, do an on-demand EKG at home, which was, uh, which was uh, remarkable at the time. <laughs> uh, but of course, you know, these, te these technologies have advanced even further, and so now we have wearable devices, um, and I think many of us have used, uh, or our patients have used uh, smart watches, uh, but there are things like rings and, and earbuds and, and even clothing that can, that can monitor uh, uh, you know, electrocardiograms, uh, and and of course, at the other end of the, uh, the spectrum are are the much more invasive things like implantable loop recorders. Um, we're going to talk a lot about these uh, some of these uh, sensors. So, uh, so one uh, one modality is is really the ability to measure the pulse. Uh, it's not just the electrocardiogram, the pulse itself. Uh, and there are a few ways that we do that, but the, one of the main ways that we do is, is really just uh, using an LED light and a light sensor in combination. Uh, and we can look at the reflection of the light uh, and then look at the, the wave, the pulse wave. Um, and based on that, we can, we can estimate uh, the, the heart rate. And if there's irregularity, we can estimate uh, whether or not somebody might be in atrial fibrillation. And these sensors, we call them PPG or photo uh, plus, uh, plethysmograms, uh, we can we can get them off of smartwatches, but also things like rings and earbuds and so on. Um, there are other ways of measuring pulse that you'll you'll start to hear more about uh, over time as, as some of these become uh, you know part of uh, the consumer devices that we have. But you can use video, you can use audio. There, there are lots of ways of, of measuring uh, pulse. But right now, PPG is really the the main modality. Um, so I, I think we're just at the beginning here of 
of, of what we're seeing with these, uh, with these uh, consumer devices, uh, they are now becoming ubiquitous. I mean, a lot of our patients have them. The big change, of course, is that patients can now go out. They don't need a prescription. They can just go out and, and get themselves a, one of these devices without asking you for permission. And, and, uh, and so they, they can start monitoring themselves and they will um, because a lot of the devices that they buy will just happen to have you know, things like AFib monitors. Uh, <clears throat> and, so, uh, and so this is really changing, I think, the landscape of what, what we do. And, and the other thing that's changing, of course, is the cost here. Um, you know, you look at something like a Holter, you know, which is still relatively inexpensive in many parts of the world. It costs $100, $150. An implantable Lupercore is much more expensive, so that's going to be out of reach for, for many uh, patients uh, outside of the U.S., uh, but still is, is, is expensive by U.S. Standard, standards. An ECG patch has made this a lot, uh, a lot cheap, uh, a little bit more expensive than the Holter, but much cheaper than an implantable device. Um, but of course, the wearable technologies are just really taking over um, with the costs you know, coming down. You can get a smartwatch now from Fitbit for about $130 um, that has ECG and PPG monitoring capability. So this is becoming um, a lot more affordable. Um, I just showed this slide, you know, not surprising. Um, there's more and more use of wearable technology. The thing to keep your eye on though is, is the ear-based uh, devices. I think that's where we're gonna see uh, more of a growth over the next few years. Uh, earbuds and 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 so on and 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 um, hearing assistant devices, uh, so I think that's where you're going to see uh, some of the growth in in uh, in sensor technology uh, being able to detect, for example, AFib with an earbud. Uh, so I think that's that's something to keep an eye out, out for. Um, the other thing that's really catapulted us uh, is is really the the pandemic effect. So um, just just as an example here. During uh, during lockdown, a few of us were were having patients come into the hospital, uh, but we needed to monitor them at home. And so, a, a live car, a live core got um, a special sort of FDA uh, emergency clearance to use the uh, their live core ECG uh, device at home, so that we could monitor them and measure uh, QT intervals. Um, so that that that's just an example of of some of the things that we started to do during the pandemic, and and obviously our, our patients. Uh, we're, we're pretty happy to do that um, as opposed to having to come into the hospital. And during the pandemic, this is just a very brief sort of proof of concept study where we had uh, patients do this at, um, at home, a drug load at home that we normally would have patients admitted for the, to the hospital for. Uh, but because we couldn't do that during the pandemic, we, we just had them you know, use these Alive Core devices at home, uh, take their medications, have them send us uh, transmissions of their electrocardiograms. We <laughs> monitored their, their QT intervals that way. And, and we're able to uh, do the drug load at home. Um, so I, I think this is also the kind of thing we're gonna start seeing more of. Um, and then the billing structure for all these things is, is changing uh, as well. And so I, I think, uh, I think uh, as the billing becomes uh, easier to do, I think more and more physicians will have <laughs> their patients uh, do this at home. Um, again, we're seeing a lot of uh, sensors uh, now being used in some of these devices. Um, so now we have an oxygen sensor, we have you know, continuous glucose monitors that, that many more and more of our patients are using. Um, and, uh, and again, I think we're gonna see this um, in, in all, sorts of, uh, all sorts of consumer devices. And you know, the, one of the challenges for us as clinicians will be to try to keep, keep, uh, keep track of some of these devices and, and, how, um, and, and how accurate they are. And you know, each, each device will have different degrees of, of, of noise, um, uh, noise abatement, uh, different degrees of sensitivity and specificity, um, at different algorithms that are used. So I, I think uh, I think that's this, this is going to be one of the challenges. You know, the science, the clinical science, is always trying to keep up with the technology changes. So we do this as best as we can, but uh, as, as clinicians, I think we have to get have a, a reasonable sense of, of some of these technologies. So let's focus a little bit more on, on atrial fibrillation. Uh, again, you know, we, we talked a little bit about PPG, we talked a little bit about ECG, um, but uh, you know, when you use a PPG to, to measure atrial fibrillation when you're looking at its pulse. Um, so because of that, uh, you really do need some kind of confirmation that an, an irregular pulse really is uh, atrial fibrillation. Um, so just keep that in mind as we talk about some of these studies. Um, and uh, with the electrocardiogram, uh, you, you, these, these have gotten good enough that you know, when a patient comes in uh, after taking an EKG with their smartwatch or other um, at-home device, 
um, I, I feel pretty comfortable uh, with the quality that, that I, 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 I feel like I can trust the, you know, my, my visual <clears throat> review of that electrocardiogram because it is clean enough um, that I'm comfortable making a diagnosis based on that. Um, the algorithms try to automate and, and give you a diagnosis, uh, but I think as a clinician, we have to over, uh, overread these. And if, if, if you overread one of these ECGs, um, you, you'll, you'll see that the quality is good enough that you know, often we're comfortable with these diagnoses. Um, because these devices are becoming, ever, uh, becoming ubiquitous, you know, I think, I think we, um, there is potential here for a little bit of data overload. So as we talked about, I think we have to uh, study this a little bit more systematically. And this is what we did with the uh, AFib algorithm on, uh, on the Apple Watch. And this is before, uh, before the ECG uh, was available on the Apple Watch and we had just the, the PPG. Um, and, and so uh, we, we try to test the ability of the smartwatch to use the PPG in order to make a, um, a, a correct diagnosis of, of atrial fibrillation. And so what the smartwatch does is, is that it, it uh, intermittently checks for irregularity and pulse. It does about a, a one minute uh, a check uh, every approximately two hours. And if there's an irregularity, it starts checking more frequently. And then if it, if it notices about five out of six checks that are irregular, uh, then it'll, it'll flag it and uh, notify the, the, the user that, that they have an irregular pulse that could be, that could be consistent with atrial fibrillation. Uh, what was exciting about this study is that we, we did it all remotely. Nobody had to go to clinic or the hospital. Uh, we just had patients download an app. They uh, consented on the app, uh, uh, answered a few questions. The algorithm was loaded onto their watch, and then they, the, the the monitoring happened in the background. They didn't have to activate it uh, after after enrolling. Uh, and if if an irregular pulse was identified, they were connected to a study health doctor, and then um, and then they were sent an ECG patch uh, by mail. They returned it by mail, and then reconnected with the study doctor once the results were back, um, and uh, and then uh, were, were were directed to uh, either follow up with their uh, primary care cardiologist if, if, if atrial fibrillation or something else was found. So again, all remotely. And so the exciting thing was that in a, in a, in a matter of months, so within about eight months, we, we were able to enroll uh, over 400,000 participants. Um, the good news too is that we did not see a lot of uh, notifications. So we were a little bit scared that we were going to get a lot of false positives and this was going to overwhelm us. In fact, we, we had to kind of enroll slowly because we were afraid that would happen, but it didn't happen. So only 0.5% of participants received a notification. Um, half of the, about half of those uh, ended up uh, joining a, a study visit doctor and about half of them ended up um, doing an, a, an ECG patch. And, uh, and then what we found was of those who did uh, complete the ECG patch, um, oh, this is this is the regular pulse notification. But about about uh, in, in those who did complete the ECG patch, uh, about 34% of them. This is you know weeks later, 34% of them had atrial fibrillation identified. Now those who didn't have atrial fibrillation identified, it could have been because they were paroxysmal, um, and they, we just didn't you know we just missed an episode. Um, but um, but but while they were wearing the patch and the watch, we found that if they had an irregular pulse identified by the watch, uh, then um, the positive predictive value uh, was about 84%. So 84% of the time, if the watch tells you that you have an irregular pulse, at least in this group, uh, it was indeed atrial fibrillation. Um, and we found that the episodes that we picked up on the patches, they were long. These were not short little episodes of AFib that we don't know what to do with. These are really long episodes. They're, it, this is by design. We wanted to catch really long episodes. Uh, and so many of our patients had you know, more than 24 hour long episodes and, uh, and about 90, almost 90% 90 of them had episodes that were lasting at least an hour. So these were what we thought were a little bit more clinically uh, significant. <clears throat> um, we also found that, that patients uh, the consumers paid attention to this, so uh, many of them did end up uh, calling us uh, their the real you know per, you know real uh, 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 physician. Uh, many of them were started on new medications or referred to a specialist or had additional testing. Not everybody, but but many of them did. <clears throat> and when we looked at other things that these irregular pulses uh, were were were, um, were finding. Uh, on these ECG patches. If it wasn't atrial fibrillation, it was often something else that was clinic clinically relevant. So uh, 
often frequent premature atrial contractions, frequent pre premature ventricular contractions, runs of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. So, so things that were clinically uh, important. And, and, and indeed, if, even if they didn't have atrial fibrillation, we still found that many of them ultimately had a diagnosis of atrial fibrillation clinically um, or had something like a stroke or heart failure. <laughs> All right, so we learned a lot by doing this uh, in sort of a, a virtual manner, you know, not, not have <laughs> the, the participants join uh, or go through a clinic or a hospital to, <laughs> to, to, get, uh, to participate in this study. Um, I mentioned the drop-off. So, you know, it was a low bar to get into the study and you got monitored. And then if, if, you, if you got a notification, you were asked to call a study doctor, but we do know that half of the participants just never called. Um, and only half of them ended up um, doing the ECG patch. And so, uh, and so these are challenges that we run into. I think we and others are, are seeing uh, this, this challenge of engaging uh, uh, some of these subjects that we recruit uh, virtually. <clears throat> and, and there is a real sort of uh, a, a real issue here with, uh, with race and ethnicity. Uh, we found that uh, after correcting for uh, all these other factors, that, uh, that African-Americans, Hispanics, and Asians were less likely to participate. Um, so uh, we had a nice distribution, uh, you know, very reflective of, of the US population uh, of participants in, in the study. But once they got notified, we, you know, if, if you were one of these um, uh, race ethnic subgroups, you were much less li likely to engage in, in getting a study visit using the ECG patch and filling out surveys. So this is something I think we all need to explore a little bit more. Uh, and this has real impact, even in the young participants. I mean, we know that older participants, if they have atrial fibrillation, many of them have risk factors for stroke. And, and you know, we went into this thinking, well, we'll, we'll you know, this, that, that'll be the greatest impact that we have. Um, but we're also finding that, you know, with even, even young patients, you know, if you have atrial fibrillation and you're very young, you're not out of the woods. You know, yes, your stroke risk might be low, but there's a reason you have atrial fibrillation. And so we're, we're finding, uh, for example, my clinic uh, alone, um, I mean, I get these patients referred to me who were young uh, who have atrial fibrillation identified. And, you know, whereas they might be blow, blown off saying, hey, you don't have a stroke risk, just, you know, uh, come back in 30 years when your stroke risk increases. Uh, when you start working up these young patients, uh, many of them do have uh, cardiomyopathies, uh, this patient, for example, who presented to us ended up having a titan related, related uh, cardiomyopathy. So this, uh, obviously, Apple Watch is not the only uh, device out there that can do this. Uh, Huawei has a, a device, Fitbit, has, they both have uh, um, watches that have the PPG feature, and, and they all have, they all are, uh, many of them are also uh, now including the ECG, ECG features. The Apple Watch came up later after our study with the ECG feature, and so now, you know, the thought is that you can combine these. So if somebody has a PPG identification of an irregular pulse uh, and they get a notification, you can ask them to, to measure an ECG, get, get yourself a nice uh, electrocardiogram uh, confirming uh, atrial fibrillation, and that might be sufficient for, for a diagnosis. Um, there are all sorts of other alerts, uh, slow and fast heart, heart rate alerts, um, uh, but these are not as well studied. So there, there are no clinical validation studies, but these are just features. And so you'll have patients presenting, say, with you know, tachycardia, uh, not otherwise really specified, not irregular, just, just fast heart rate when they're, when they're sitting down, not doing anything. Uh, and we don't quite know exactly how to work these patients up, but you know, once you start getting a, a clinical history, you, you might be clued in. And of course, we talked about some of the, uh, some of the emerging technologies. I don't have time to go into some of this, but this is just some work we've done with AI and, and the use of electrocardiograms uh, that, that may eventually uh, will be able to apply to, to, the, to, the, to the, um, the, the smartwatch. I did want to mention, though, a couple of ongoing uh, or, or clinical trials that were just starting. Um, so, uh, so Johnson & Johnson just start, uh, a few years ago started uh, their, their Heartline study. Uh, this is sponsored by them, and uh, the goal is to recruit 150,000 participants who are randomized to either standard care or using an Apple Watch to detect atrial fibrillation, followed by anticoagulation, and they will be uh, followed for um, a, a stroke reduction, uh, and that's going to take a few years as well. Uh, and then uh, we just got, uh, we're working now with Northwestern, uh, Johns Hopkins at UCSF, uh, this is a study led by Rod Passman over at Northwestern. 
and uh, this was just funded by the NIH. <laughs> uh, the goal is to recruit 5,000 patients. The idea here is that patients who are already on anticoagulation, who are on the lower end of the spectrum of risk for stroke, might be able to just stop taking their anticoagulant. And then they would stop it. And if their watch notifies them that they have an episode, then they can take, it, take their anticoagulant for 30 days and then come off again. And this could be a real paradigm uh, shifting uh, approach of, of, of you know, using wearable devices to make a real impact for patients and managing their disease in a slightly different way that we couldn't do you know, five, 10 years ago. So, that, so we're gonna start recruiting early, uh, early next year for that study. All right, so I'm gonna cut ahead here and just thank, um, you know, this was a big team involved in Apple Heart and there's a lot, lot more coming um, from the original study, from new studies that we have ongoing this is still still very uh, very exciting work that we're uh, that we're working on, and uh, this is some of the, our group from the machine learning uh, uh, cardiovascular laboratory. But uh, thank you everybody. So sorry it had to be a little bit short, but I, I, I do I'm gonna have to run pretty soon. So I know everybody wants to ask you questions, Dr. Perez. That was really fast, really fascinating. I wonder though if you can listen to Dr. Steve Chen's story. Steve, can you please? pop on the video and because I think that you two need to know each other. Uh, Dr. Steve Chen is from USC. He's one of our co-leaders and he uh, has his own uh, patient story to tell. He's a PharmD, he's a major national leader in adding the pharmacist to care team and now he has his own patient experience related to sleep and using devices uh, to manage AFib. Go ahead, Steve. Well, I hate to disappoint Dr. Perez. I'm probably uh, a story he's heard a hundred times, but I'll, I'll be as quick as I can. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm 57. Um, I generally take good care of my health. I exercise every day, have for you know well over 10 years, at least 30 minutes every day. And uh, BMI is you know below 24. Uh, I even went vegetarian for a year. Uh, that was all I could handle. Uh, about 10 years ago, I experienced some PVCs, uh, and it was just a shocker to me at the time because I, I didn't know what it was, and uh, you know, I thought I was going to pass out, got hospitalized, got worked up for everything. They couldn't find a cause. They just assumed it was PVCs, um, so I just kind of ignored it. Then uh, five years ago, uh, we got a new dean for the School of Pharmacy, and uh, he inspired me to not sleep. Right? He uh, functions with three to four hours of sleep a night. That was perfectly fine. And you know, here he promoted me to associate dean, so I thought I have to do the same. So I, I cut my sleep dramatically. Um, those palpitations uh, that had occurred about 10 years ago came back. Uh, it got kind of annoying a couple of times, ended up going to urgent care. I was very concerned. Uh, they checked it out. They said, PVCs, go home, don't worry. Um, then about a year ago, I, I told my PCP, I said, hey, I, I think it's really bothering me. Can, can we do something else? And you know, he sort of thought it was just stress and I needed to sleep more, right? Um, and then uh, a few months after that visit with my PCP, uh, I was at a student health fair that I was precepting. And because there were no patients showing up, I volunteered to get my blood pressure checked. Found out it was high, I had a systolic of 150, 160. Uh, so I quickly went and got followed up. Um, because I'm a pharmacist, I got my systolic less than 130 in 13 days. Now it's less than 120, very excited about that. Um, I also got started on uh, uh, rosuvastatin, just FYI. Starting dose for Asians, as you probably all know, it's five milligrams. A uh, physician gave me 10. I kept it. I was just curious to know what it would do. I got a 62% reduction in LDL on 10 milligrams, so I cut it to five. Uh, so that worked out well. Got checked for sleep apnea, negative. Um, spoke to Hattie, shared some of what was going on. Um, Hattie you know, told me, go get a Xyopatch. And I so I go, okay, maybe I will. Okay, I will. So, so I got his iPads done. Took me two and a half months to get it. Uh, took me two months to get the result read. Um, and that's when I found out I had a 2% AFib burden um, and uh, less than 10% PVC. So I bought an Apple Watch. Um, I thought the uh, patch was wrong until I got my first notification about a month in. Uh, probably two months in a row, I had um, episodes uh, once a month of lasting at least five hours or so. Uh, and so after I've uh, fixed my sleep, I hate to tell you this, I'm experimenting with supplements, a few, which I think are safe and reasonably okay. Uh, I really had nothing for the last two months in terms of episodes, at least for my Apple Watch. So, so I think I'm turning the corner, at least doing a few things right. 
um, shared this story with some friends and colleagues. And it's funny, the more I share it, the more I find out that people have symptoms and aren't paying attention to them um, or have risk factors who aren't getting screened. So anyway, I, I, for what it's worth, I thought, um, you know, Patty Vaughn told me to tell my story, so I did. And, uh, hopefully someone's doing something from it. Thank you. So Steve, the part that you didn't tell them that you told me is yeah. that by increasing your sleep, you saw a direct relationship with the notifications of AFib on your Apple Watch. That is correct. You so I was sleeping got because you were not feeling well. Correct. I was sleeping four to five hours. That shifted to eight at least now. And yes, that, that, that is correct. So that plus who knows what the supplements are doing seem, seem to be correlated. Well, Dr. Chen, that I mean, thank you for sharing that that story. But and, and you're right, this is this is this is not unusual. <laughs> these are the kinds of stories that we hear. You know, I think the really interesting thing too is that, is that with these devices now out in the world and, and and with consumers just getting them directly, what we're finding is that uh, you know people like you uh, are out there and and they're getting diagnosed a lot earlier. Um, you've probably had my guess is this atrial fibrillation now for quite some time, and but just didn't quite know it. Um, and, uh, and, and so, you know, I, I think what's happening is that people who might have been told, you know, five years ago might have been told, oh, don't worry, you're young, it's, it's probably nothing, it's probably anxiety. Um, no, they're getting diagnosed and, and they're coming in a lot earlier. And that, I think makes a difference because uh, as you find, as you're finding, I mean, things like sleep, you know, relatively, you know, uh, straightforward things you could do can really impact your health um, and with things like sleep and, 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 and in other cases, you know, we, we, we have found, you know, being able to intervene early on an early cardiomyopathy, for example. Um, so I think, I, think, I think they are making a difference. So thank, thank you, thank you for sharing that. that, that yeah. incredible story. Thank you, thank you for your great presentation. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Perez and Chen, Dr. Chen. I mean, I think that this is really amazing and it's a great reminder. I think we started a lot of these meetings a few years ago on the Silicon Valley side with our meeting about um, coronary CT. And I feel like having patients empowered to see their data would address exactly what you said, Steve, about I didn't believe it at first. You know, I needed the data to see it. And when I'm hearing, you know, Fiona and Katie's talk about, you know, how to work on your sleep, I just think it's going to help. And Fiona, maybe you've seen this in your clinical practice. Seeing the data might actually help people make change. What do you guys think? <laughs> It, it depends on what problem we're talking about. If it's insomnia, I do not want them tracking their sleep in the way with a wearable. Absolutely not. Because those correlations with certain wearables, if you're, an, if you're a decent sleeper, pretty good. As far as total sleep time and wake time is not as good. Sleep staging, absolutely not. Um, so it's not giving you the information you're getting. People with insomnia because of this anxiety about sleep or treating sleep like a performance. Now, in your case, Dr. Chen, sleep was a performance. You were not allowing yourself sufficient time to perform sleep. <laughs> That's insufficient sleep. There was also stress, right? So again, those are two big causes of cardiovascular or cardiovascular risk factors, I should say. So you had insufficient sleep, you had stress, and then you didn't have sleep apnea. I'm glad you got that checked out. Risk factor for Asians is higher because of craniofacial structure. Um, so you did your homework, but for you, you weren't allowing yourself sufficient opportunity to perform sleep. People with insomnia are allowing themselves way too much time to perform sleep, and as a result, their performance is bad. And so if they're tracking their sleep and they're reinforcing that anxiety, oh my God, I'm supposed to get eight hours of sleep, and look, I only got six that night, it's going to make their insomnia worse. So it really depends. Awesome. Well, um, I know Bill is going to be up, but maybe we could take a few minutes for other questions for Dr. Barwick, or um, if you had some slides you wanted some, to finish up. There were some questions in the chat, and I did, There, I don't know how much time I have, but someone asked about napping. You'll find my answer to a lot of this stuff is it depends. So should I, should I use a wearable? It depends. Should I take a nap? It depends. There's genetic variability in napping, just like there is in sleep duration and sleep timing. Some people are unable to nap even if they want. Some people lie down to nap, sleep for two or three hours, feel awful when they wake up. Napping does not work for them. But some people are able to lie down, fall asleep for 20 or so minutes, wake up naturally, feel refreshed. Great, use a nap. Um, it is important to note, you, you want to be careful though. You want to keep your nap to 30 minutes or less, at least seven to nine hours before your bedtime. More than 30 minutes, the likelihood of going into deep sleep is greater and deep sleep is what will disrupt your sleep the coming night. And if you nap, or doze too close to bedtime, you're eating into your sleep drive. 
which is the sleep pressure that will put you to sleep when bedtime arrives. Uh, as far as over-the-counter sleep aids, if you're using an over-the-counter sleep aid for pain that happens to be sedating or for allergies that happens to be sedating, all right. If you're using something only for sleep, whether it's over-the-counter or prescription, no. If you're, using it for, if you're using it only for sleep, not for pain, depression, something else, then no, you shouldn't be using it. Every medication, actually prescription, over-the-counter, substance like alcohol or cannabis, changes normal sleep patterns. Sedation is not sleep. Almost always it suppresses REM sleep, so you get a little less REM sleep, which is important for emotion regulation, among other things, consolidating what we learn in, during the day. Um, some of them suppress deep sleep as well, so you get less deep sleep. So much better to do the, make the behavioral and cognitive changes that will actually establish and support good sleep than it is to rely on a sleep aid. There's no sleep medication that produces sleep drive, the, the molecular equivalent of sleep <coughs> drive. There's no, you, you do that all on your own. So you actually don't need a sleep aid just for sleep. Um, yeah, I don't know. I did have some other slides to go through, but I do not want to take away from the next presenter. So just let me know what I need to do here. All right. Um, Patty, I don't know if you had an opinion. Otherwise, should we move to Bill? I don't know where Hattie disappeared. Yeah, okay. I think we can move on. We move on. <laughs> only got uh, 25 minutes left for the presentations and uh, we still have more to go. So uh, certainly want to thank everyone for their um, uh, talk so far. It's been uh, exciting and, uh, <clears throat> and I think it's a new area, you know, for us as we go ahead. Uh, I'm going to hit share screen here and uh, if you allow me to share the screen, let me uh, tell me if you see my screen at this point in time. <clears throat> it's showing your phone, I think. Um, but oh, here we go. Something is happening. Hang on. Sharing you're sharing screen. Zoom, and you're now you're sharing your phone. Oh, and you, here's your slide. You, <laughs> All right. All right. So uh, certainly we want to thank everyone so far. And I'm trying to roll this into one uh, uh, summary here as we uh, finish, including everything that we uh, are talking about. And we're talking about uh, atrial fibrillation and uh, perhaps uh, the worst thing that we can have for AF is, uh, is stroke. And uh, that's certainly a, a difficulty. Uh, disclosures are shown here. And uh, I will go to the next slide. So let's talk about uh, Steve. Uh, so Steve uh, presented his uh, case history uh, for us. Thank you very much, Steve. You are not alone. We estimate that uh, there's approximately 12 million people in the US right now, and it's probably going to go higher with atrial fibrillation. So you're not out there by yourself at this point. What can Steve do to reduce his chance of atrial fib? Uh, well, we know he's doing more sleep and uh, trying to re reduce his stress, that's important. What other important things can he do? Uh, Steve, don't, get any, don't have any more birthdays. So age is a non-modifiable risk factor. Staying young is important, uh, but modifiable things you can do are try to avoid hypertension, Try to avoid heart disease, especially heart failure, hyperthyroidism, excess alcohol use, do not become obese. Uh, try to avoid sleep apnea, as you've already done the study, and diabetes. These are ways or risk factors for atrial fibrillation that we want to avoid as much as we can for that. And so for Steve, uh, my advice as you look at this slide here is to stay less than 55 years of age. So stop having birthdays at this point. You can see as you get older, there's an increase for both women and men prevalence of atrial fibrillation that we see uh, that goes rapidly up to achieve 10 or 15% by the time you are 85 or higher. And if we add all of these together, roughly one in four of us on this presentation, so that's going to be literally 20 of those individuals who are listening right now on this talk 
are going to have atrial fibrillation during your lifetime. So it's our most common cardiac arrhythmia. And thanks to Marco for presenting the uh, material on detection of atrial fibrillation. And this is just a quick review here of the published studies showing that his uh, technique with the plethysmography of detection of AFib uh, was, can be fairly sensitive. It's less specific because it does detect other things like PACs and uh, PVCs. So the sensitivity is a little less. And we're pretty much going as he is with trying to get ECG confirmation of our atrial fibrillation at this time. And these are the, in fact, modalities out there currently available for detecting atrial fibrillation. You can see the sensitivity for these techniques and specificity is 90% or higher for both the wearable devices, the single lead ECGs, the finger probes, the iPhone that does ECG with it, as well as those uh, modified blood pressure monitors that can all detect it. And again, 90% sensitivity and specificity in detecting AFib. So we do have screening methods available to detect AFib. And as you know, it, if we screen for it, we will find it. And if you look at these student health uh, screenings that are shown on the top, roughly 2% of the population who show up at a screening health fair are going to be positive for atrial fibrillation. Again, our most common arrhythmia, cardiac arrhythmia, and it's seen in about 2% of the population. And importantly is those are individuals where we could significantly reduce the chance of stroke in those populations. I would also recommend for Steve, if he knows a pharmacist that the pharmacy screening has been uh, effective. And as you can see, uh, as Steve uh, quickly quotes, there's a pharmacy within five miles of almost everyone in the state of California. And it is a very accessible uh, healthcare uh, provider. And obviously, the pharmacists are in a unique position because they're sitting there with direct patient care. Patients go into pharmacies, talk to the pharmacist, present their other risk factors, including hypertension, cholesterol treatment. Uh, and, and our pharmacists were the premier monitors for our anticoagulation clinics for years in that particular setting. So we can see that <clears throat> pharmacies are in a unique position and we're trying to work with trying to improve access to pharmacists. And to do that, we need to get perhaps some reimbursement for their use, but they're gonna be very useful. Now, the <clears throat> European Society of Cardiology and the Australian Heart Foundation uh, clearly recommend in many cases atrial fib screening. In the United States, we do know it works, but at this time, the U.S. Preventative Task Force does not recommend AF or atrial fib screening at this time, again, finding that there is insufficient evidence at this point. So I'm not going to bring up uh, our, uh, uh, our discussions with the U.S. Preventative Task Force they're fairly conservative, and uh, we hope that that eventually changes because uh, looking at AF screening would be useful in preventing strokes in the United States. So let's turn to atrial fibrillation. Again, it's going to be in approximately one in four of us listening to this broadcast today. We'll have AF during our lifetimes uh, for that. <clears throat> it does, as Steve notes, uh, reduces your cardiac output by about 25%, losing the kick between your atrium and your ventricle. You can get fast heart, slow heart, but the real risk in atrial fibrillation to many of us is that you get stasis or low blood flow in the left atrium, especially the left atrial appendage, producing clots in the appendage, which are fairly sizable, about the size of your thumb, and can produce a significant or large stroke from that. In fact, the stroke from atrial fibrillation is more likely to be debilitating than any other type of stroke. 
and lethal at the end of one year from an AF stroke, 52% of those individuals were dead from the stroke. So it is a often lethal uh, <clears throat> uh, complication. Now, who gets atrial fib and uh, what is the risk? Well, what we're going to look at here is that it, if you have atrial fib, it significantly increases your chance of further developing heart failure, but stroke is shown on the right. If we look for Steve on the further right, you can see without atrial fib, you can see the solid line is his chance of having a stroke. It goes up significantly to the, in fact, the wiggly line if he has atrial fib. So it really doubles his chance of having a stroke over the next five years as a male. Uh, for women, it's an even higher risk factor. You notice that for women having a stroke, it's relatively low, the solid line in brown shown there over five years. But look at how high the line goes with atrial fibrillation, the broken line that you see. And you can see that's a four or five fold increase in the chance of having a stroke if you're a female who develops atrial fibrillation. And the five-year rate is in the neighborhood of 10% chance of stroke if you have AF for five years as a female. So very high risk in those individuals. How do we uh, calculate the risk for individuals? Well, a number of clinical variables are there. Um, Marco alluded to the fact that some of this may be genetic as well. And we're starting to, uh, in fact, look through that as well as a marker. But the CHADS VAS score, which is shown on the upper left, are the typical risk factors for having a stroke with atrial fibrillation. If you have any one of these, that increases your chance of stroke, heart failure, hypertension, uh, age over 65 or 75, diabetes, prior stroke, thromboembolic disease, vascular disease, and women have a higher chance of having a stroke than men, as we can see earlier for that. As the CHADS VAS score goes up in the center, so does the risk of stroke. It goes anywhere from about zero or 0.2% a year, all the way up to 15 to 20% a year as you have higher risk factors for it. And as Steve is monitoring with his Apple Watch, the burden of atrial fib that he has, as you increase your amount of atrial fib from no atrial fib on the bottom, uh, in green to more than six minutes a day. Uh, you can see in some cases, a CHADS VAS score of three, just having six minutes of atrial fib a day doubles your risk of stroke in that population. And of course, as you go up to 24 hours of atrial fib, the risk goes uh, higher as well and doubles for almost all the risk factors as you get more consistent or persistent atrial fibrillation for that. Now we mentioned that one of those risk factors was thromboembolic or thrombosis. Uh, who do we worry about for the hypercoagulable states? And, and almost all of these are genetic. Uh, and that is an individual who has thrombosis at an early age, less than 50 years of age, who has a family history of thrombosis or a very large thrombosis, uh, those would be individuals who may have a hypercoagulable state. So in addition to having stasis from atrial fib, if you've got a higher tendency to develop coagulation, you're at higher risk. And the hypercoagulation syndromes that are common are shown here. The name calm shapes, each letter in that word stands for one factor, which is shown in the list below uh, for that. And the common ones that we see more frequently are uh, increased um, factor eight, uh, which is seen in about 11% of the population, factor five Leiden in about 5%, depending on your ethnicity. Uh, and if we add all of these up, about one in five of us has literally a mutation that is associated with hypercoagulation uh, for that. And that will increase our chance of stroke. How do we find out about that? Unfortunately, we have to do either a strong family history in the past of having strokes or thrombotic disease, or we can do blood tests for that. And the blood tests routinely can detect 
who has the hypercoagulation syndrome. So one of the things that we can do for atrial fib uh, to avoid the risk of stroke is to get rid of the atrial fibrillation. So that's called rhythm control. We want to take the atrial fib and keep you always or keep Steve always in sinus rhythm. How do we do that? Well, we do have antiarrhythmic drugs that work beyond lifestyle and they work. The common ones, uh, the 1A and 1C drugs are effective in about 45% of the people in preventing atrial fibrillation from developing in the next year or two for that. Uh, the more Potent medicine, amiodarone, about 60% effective, but it has side effects. And when we want to go higher than that, we are talking to about, about procedures, which are ablation, either radiofrequency or cryoablation ablation of areas of the left, atrial, uh, left atrium to prevent the abnormal electrical activity as spreading across the atrium at that time the so-called ablation studies. And the ablation trials are more successful, perhaps uh, 45 to 80% uh, successful in, uh, in uh, preventing atrial fibrillation. Nothing is 100% successful, but in certain individuals who repetitively go into atrial fibrillation, the ablation of the EP process is very successful. For individuals who are in atrial fib, then to prevent the thrombosis and the clot and the stroke, we use anticoagulation. Now, the first th uh, medicine that we used for that was literally aspirin. Even better was Coumadin at about 64% reduction in stroke. But now we have even a better alternative as well. And this looks at a, a uh, direct oral anticoagulant. Uh, which is a 10A inhibitor compared to Coumadin. Remember I said Coumadin was 64% reduction in strokes. You can see that in this case, Apixaban is even better, 21% better than Coumadin in reducing strokes. So we're in the neighborhood of perhaps 80% reduction in strokes by giving this uh, medicine. And as you can see at the bottom uh, graph, that a Pixaban, a direct oral anticoagulant, is also safer than Coumadin, about 31% fewer major bleeds uh, compared to uh, Coumadin in that case. So this is now in the recommendations. These are the direct oral anticoagulants are the preferred mode in individuals with atrial fib who require stroke prevention in that case. If we look at the direct oral anticoagulants that are out, <coughs> The one with the uh, longer half-life compared with one with a shorter half-life, uh, which is shown here, apixaban versus rivaroxaban. We can see on this slide here that the one with the longer half-life given twice a day is a little bit lower stroke reduction, 18% on the left, and a significantly lower major bleed uh, of about 42% in the slide on the right. So this is the most frequently used in the US uh, direct oral anticoagulant for atrial fibrillation, uh, primarily because of its lower stroke rate and because of its uh, lower major bleed rate that we see here for that in individuals who have atrial fibrillation without valvular disease. Recently, we've also looked at individuals with valvular heart disease and atrial fib. Uh, which was not studied as well before, but we now still see that, again, the direct oral anticoagulant, in this case, apixaban, uh, is, has lower stroke rate in individuals with AF and valvular heart disease. And this came out this last month, uh, showing as well lower bleeding rate as well for that. So 43% less stroke rate and 49% lower uh, uh, major bleed rate for this drug, which is the one that is most popular in the United States for this uh, entity. Now, there are individuals that we all know who cannot take an anticoagulant because they will bleed. They have a serious GI pathology or something else, and a major bleed would be a problem. What can we use in those cases? Well, many of the clots 
that lead to stroke in atrial fibrillation form in the left atrial appendage. In fact, 90% of the clots and strokes come from the left atrial appendage. So can we just tie off or eliminate or remove the left atrial appendage? And this has been studied, left atrial closure versus anticoagulation. And I'll go over a few of those studies here, including the uh, implantation of a device that you can see here. Uh, this is going to be comparison of devices that you see here, uh, where a closure device up on the upper right is placed at the entrance of the left atrial appendage to prevent any blood from getting in there and blood clots from escaping in there into the atrium and then going up to the brain to produce a stroke at that point. Well, I think your slide, oh, there you go. And in this particular case, the left atrial appendage occlusion device appeared to be similar to the direct oral anticoagulant in reducing strokes in those individuals. So it was found to be non-inferior in this particular case in a large randomized prospective trial uh, that was done uh, for that. So again, if you cannot tolerate anticoagulation, then a device could be a alternative to prevent the thrombus in the left atrial appendage from going out for a stroke. And it appears to be similar. That is the device closure or elimination or removal of the appendage appears to be similar to anticoagulation in, this, in the studies of preventing a stroke in those particular populations and preventing death in that uh, cardiovascular death in the population as well for that. And here's the most recent study looking at two devices. One is uh, Amplatz or an Amulet uh, occlusion device versus the Watchman device that were used. And you can see that they're fairly similar in the graph on the bottom uh, for producing uh, uh, subsequent strokes or complications for that. But what I also want you to notice here is the slide in the middle, uh, which uh, in color, which shows that even when we approach these individuals with the occlusion device of the watchman, watchman or the amulet, and we say, okay, these are individuals who can't take an anticoagulation. Notice that about 5% of people who receive these devices eventually do require anticoagulation. And you'd say, why is that? You've occluded the appendage. Well, that is true, but when we monitor with intravascular uh, or intracardiac ultrasound and TEE or transesophageal echo, we find that sometimes clots do develop on the backside of this device and are still available in the atrium, even though we've occluded the appendage totally. And in some situations, the device doesn't quite fit the appendage and some blood gets in and some blood could exit and that blood could be a clot. And so about 5% of our patients do wind up being on long-term anticoagulants out to three years as we see here for it. So it's not 100% proven that we can eliminate anticoagulation in these individuals, but it, it is a good alternative for individuals who are at very high risk of bleeding in that patient population for that. So here is our 2019 recommendations, ACC, AHA for this. And what we can see is uh, here are the recommendations for occlusion devices of the left atrial appendage. And it's basically a 2B indication. It's not green, that's a yellow bar for that, meaning that it is recommended in some cases, especially those who cannot take or tolerate an anticoagulation for it. And to the right, we see cardiac surgery also is a 2B, meaning if you're in the operating zone and you have the left atrial appendage in front of you, it's probably a not needed appendage, much like your appendix is. And if the surgeon's there and can eliminate or remove it at that time, it is a reasonable recommendation while you have open heart surgery exposure at that time. 
And then on the bottom left, what we see is the recommendation for catheter ablation, still not a 1A indication. It is a 2B indication, uh, especially for individuals who are symptomatic with their atrial fibrillation uh, for it. Uh, and the real thing is atrial fibrillation can push someone at a faster rate into a cardiomyopathy. And we wanna avoid that. And ablation is fairly good at preventing individuals in AF going on to congestive heart failure uh, for that. And if we look on this whole screen here, what's the only green light that we see? The only green light is on the bottom right. And that is weight reduction reduces atrial fibrillation. And so Steve, for your lifestyle, we wanna make sure you you stay or keep your BMI at 24.5 that you had uh, and that we don't uh, add extra weight because that will increase the chance of atrial fibrillation. And it's the only 1A indication by the, in the current 2019 AHA uh, criteria for that. So in summary, what do we say for Steve at this point in time? He's had one or two episodes of atrial fibrillation. Uh, obviously, we, uh, first recommendation is rest, which he's, which he's done. He's increased his sleep, he's tried to re release or re reduce his stress area, and hopefully that will be enough to prevent atrial fibrillation. But how about if he gets it once a month or once every uh, twice a year or something like that? Is there anything else we can offer? What, what we do offer is what's called a pill in the pocket. So the antiarrhythmic therapy, which works in about 50% of cases, I have patients where we give them a pill, a single pill, an antiarrhythmic drug. If they do their uh, monitoring on their watch or their uh, cardio device, see that they're in atrial fibrillation, and they don't go out of it and go back to sinus in an hour or two, we can push them faster to go back to sinus rhythm with a single dose of an antiarrhythmic. I have them carry that in their pocket should they need it while they're traveling or whatever. Pill in the pocket can be very successful in reducing that prevalence of atrial fibrillation uh, episodes and certainly reducing the burden of, of it. If you go into atrial fib and stay in it uh, despite the pill, then we would recommend cardioversion so that you're not in it for a long time. And the reason for that is seen on the top. Atrial fibrillation begets atrial fibrillation. The longer you're in it, the harder it is to get out of it, the more likely you'll be in it chronically at that time. So we want to start very early. And so cardioversion would be recommended with anticoagulation, obviously. And then we would start some antiarrhythmic drugs, hoping that 50% chance that that would control it. Uh, and if we had to, we might advance to amiodarone at a 65% chance of controlling the AFib. If the medicines don't work, you continue to go into atrial fibrillation with symptoms, including uh, uh, shortness of breath or heart failure concerns. We would then recommend ablation. That can be radiofrequency or cryo at this time. Uh, that has a higher success rate, 50 to 80%, but not 100% successful. Uh, I wish I had Marco still on board because obviously he's doing ablation right now, uh, probably on an AFib patient, and he could uh, chime in here with that. If you remain in atrial fib, we have to put you on anticoagulation because almost everyone is at an increased risk. Uh, for it with either a history of hypertension or age as you go on. Uh, for individuals who are in and out of atrial fib, that's called paroxysmal. For those who are go into atrial fib and stay in it, it's called persistent atrial fib. Uh, those cases may require different drugs, multiple drugs and repeated ablations to try to keep them out of atrial fib all the time having either anticoagulation or left atrial appendage closure to prevent stroke in that situation. And for those individuals who have had atrial fib for a long time, meaning more than a year or two, who are chronically in AFib, very hard to get those people out of it. We need to 
practice not rhythm control, but rate control, try to keep them at a reasonable ventricular rate so they don't go into heart failure. With that, those cases obviously should have anticoagulation or left atrial appendage closure to prevent it at that point in time for that. And in conclusion, at two o'clock, we come to the risk of atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is still our most common cardiac arrhythmia, and we expect it'll affect about 12 million people in the US. And as obesity increases in the US, that rate seems to be going up as well for that. Atrial fib could be asymptomatic, maybe as many as half the people don't know they're in it. Others will experience the palpitations as Steve had, notice it. Uh, they may also have a reduced cardiac output and at very fast heart rates could develop heart failure for it. Our initial uh, treatment is rhythm control because AFib begets AFib. We want to try to keep you in sinus rhythm as long as we can. So we wanna start out very early with rhythm control and to try to keep you in sinus rhythm at that time. If we can't keep you in sinus rhythm, then we have to go to rate control, keeping your ventricular rate reasonable with medication or ablation uh, for that. And of course, the most serious adverse event with AFib is stroke, stroke or systemic emboli. The stroke, as I said, is literally Half of the patients who get a stroke from AF are dead within one year. So we want to avoid that. And none of us on this seminar today wants to entertain the thought of a stroke. Stroke and systemic emboli can both be reduced with anticoagulants. We have even better anticoagulants today uh, for that uh, that are well tolerated and fairly easy to uh, uh, access and tolerate. Uh, for those who cannot be on an anticoagulant, we're left with consideration of the left atrial appendage, either removal at surgery or occlusion with an interventional device, which seemed to be comparable to the anticoagulation therapy uh, for that. And that concludes my presentation, and then we can open it to any questions uh, for those who are still here. Patty, if you're talking, we can't hear you for some reason. But Go I'll, ahead, Daryl. No, there you are. There you are. Uh, oh, thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Sorry about that. Um, great, great talk. So important to me as a stroke neurologist to have this review. And I love the link you shared, you know, that we've been hearing throughout the talk about other ways that we can reduce stroke from AFib. And hearing initially about stroke and then of course all of the devices, which I think in anticoagulation, I think the devices are getting better and so they're having better outcomes, but I really appreciate the point that you made that that's if you're not able to tolerate anticoagulation because there are always issues with devices that land, may land you on anticoagulation as well. Um, I know that it's closing in on two o'clock. Were there questions in the chat? Here we go. Um, one question. Is the overall incidence of AFib increasing in the general population? And if so, why? Are we just getting better at detecting it? Um, so quick answer to that is yes, it is increasing. Um, number one, our detection capability is greater. Uh, you have to realize that in the older days, you only got detected if you went into an office and someone detected a fast heart rate or a slow heart rate or irregularity and then got an EKG in the office. Now with these devices, we have much more uh, chance of picking it up uh, without that. But we do think the overall prevalence is increasing because it may be related to the risk factors. And one of the risk factors is obesity. And there is no question in the United States uh, as we look uh, at the population, there is a continued increase in obesity in almost all ethnic uh, groups. Thanks, Bill. 
And then there was another question, um, which you started to address in the talk about the thinking regarding pill in the pocket for AFib control. This particular individual, Matt, was saying his resting heart rate is 48, so bradycardia is an issue. Taking medications like beta blockers and metoprolol could be a real problem. So are people, other than you, using the pill in the pocket? And how common is that? <laughs> Um, so pill in the pocket could be a couple of different types of pills. Uh, so one of the pills could be a beta blocker. And if stress is a, a, a feature, uh, beta blocker can reduce your synergist, uh, uh, your sympathetic tone uh, slightly, and you may it may help you uh, to have it go away. The antiarrhythmic that's commonly used for pill in the pocket is flecainide. And that would, could be used in someone with a slower heart rate. So that is usually given as a single dose. Uh, we typically give like 200 milligrams of it um, at that time, uh, but only to individuals who do not have structural heart disease. So the key in that is it has to be, you have to be evaluated by a cardiologist, have an echo, uh, and make sure that you do not have any underlying coronary disease or structural heart disease, because that pill or that 1C antiarrhythmic does carry some risk if there's existing cardiovascular disease, and we wouldn't recommend it in that case. Since we're over two o'clock, thank you so much to all our panelists. I think Bill and Steve are the only ones left here. Hattie, did you need to announce anything before we wrap up? I'll just say that our next University of Best Practices is uh, again going to cover a very important topic for stroke, and that is on carotid artery disease and intracranial atherosclerotic disease. Dr. Nurali Vora, who's been helping us today, is going to be leading uh, efforts to put that program together from Monday, December 12th, from 12 to 2. And with that, I'll just say, I think we all learned so much. We did pack the program a little tighter than we wanted to, but we weren't sure whether Dr. Uh, Marco Perez was going to be with us. Bill, thank you so much for that amazing, fast, course and what do you do if you discover AFib? And thank you, Nirali, for helping to facilitate this meeting. Thanks, everyone. Have a great month. See you soon. Thanks, Thanks everyone. And uh, I hope everyone has a great Thanksgiving. Uh, that is in the interim at this time. And uh, so today was stroke. We started out with our first speaker who announced that she was on the crew. Uh, I guess of uh, Stanford was that uh, and uh, so uh, the one thing if you've ever been on crew what you hear from the coxswain all of the time is stroke 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 so uh, we uh, <laughs> finished up with stroke so that kept us the uh, uh, on that so everyone I want you to uh, row your way into uh, Thanksgiving and uh, make sure we don't overcompensate uh, and avoid obesity. So have a great Thanksgiving.